this whole street, then you'll I'm find sorry. it. Uh, yeah, I, I can't see. So, okay. <laughs> but you can tell me what the name is. Whole is. street. Okay. I can house. Okay. 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 Fantastic. I will be there. One last maybe Joyce to close the one. Okay. So it sounds like this is more popular than expected. Like demo scene. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, we'll make sure to get a bigger room for next year. Yeah. We're about ready to start. We'll see. Uh, mm -hmm. Give them another minute and we'll see. Yeah, come on in. So don't worry about having to see the screen. We don't, you know, we're not going to be showing slides or anything. We'll be talking mostly, so find some room where you can sit down and get in. Come on, you should have. Come, 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 okay. Come. Okay, cool. Okay, let's give everybody uh, maybe a next, oh, actually, we're, we're ready to start. So. Okay, shall we go? Well, why don't we get the three of us already to start out? Okay, can everybody hear me like this, or do you need me to use the microphone? Just want to go in here. Yep. Okay. And go in. Okay. Well, we use the mic anyway. Okay. I'd like to welcome you all to this session. I'm assuming this is everybody's first time at SIGGRAPH. And I'd like to welcome you all here. Um, all of us. Okay. Sure. Okay. So I guess then I will go this way. Yes. Okay. First of all, like to welcome you all to SIGGRAPH and give you a little bit of an overview of what you can expect to see this week and why we're all so excited about coming to SIGGRAPH every year. Just to give you a little bit of background, I used to be president of the organization that runs SIGGRAPH, so I served as president from 2002 to 2005. I've been coming to SIGGRAPH every year since 1987, okay, so this is my 32nd time and we'll still continue to come for the foreseeable future. Uh, what we'd like to do in this session is to share with you a little bit of the excitement that we all feel about this conference and why we keep coming back and what it is you can expect to see. And yeah, by all means, come on in. And what it is that makes SIGGRAPH so special. So. <laughs> I think next year we'll arrange for a larger room. <laughs> so, yeah, for, I don't know if the folks who are participating in live streaming uh, realize what's happening here. Uh, the room is entirely full, and we have more people still coming in, so we're going to try and make this as exciting as possible and share a little bit of what it is we do. So to give you a little bit of background as to what I do, you know, who am I? I'm a software engineer. I've been writing software for three and a half decades now. And one of the pieces of software that you may know the most is a piece of software called Maya. I was the director of engineering on the Maya project at Alias Wavefront 20 years ago when we first created it. And Maya has been the number one selling software in the entertainment industry ever since we released it. So pretty interesting piece of software and have been a SIGGRAPH volunteer all throughout that period. So it's been 
exciting for me to see the industry evolve and to see how things move. And why do I come back every year? Well, it's to go and see where it's going next and see what we can continue to do. And SIGGRAPH is the one place where you can see what's going to happen, what the next technologies are going to be, what the next Maya is going to be, and why you want to come back. So that's what gets me excited. And rather than stealing everybody else's thunder, I'm going to let the others explain also why they come back. So, Tomas. Or me? Okay. Mashuda. Okay. Mashuda, go ahead. Okay, Mashuda, go ahead. I'll go to, I'll go to last. Um, I'm, I used to be an academic. I worked at three different UK universities and um, then I had a little bit of a crisis, quit my job and started a startup, which is pretty scary, but <laughs> it's, it's a way to do some interesting, um, you know, cutting edge technology. And um, I have been coming to SIGGRAPH since 2001. So a very long time. <laughs> and uh, what keeps bringing me back is the opportunity to see the latest state-of-the-art work, um, the latest state-of-the-art research in my field, uh, to see the fusion of art and science, which is this amazing conference. And um, I, I, I hope you all get to experience um, some of it and feel the same excitement about it. Okay, so it looks at me. Uh, so uh, for those who are for, who is for the first time here, all of you guys, most of you, all right. So I have to give you warning, okay? This is a come once and it never goes back. You'll be coming every year now. <laughs> so that, that's for sure, right? Yeah. Uh, so my name is Tomasz Bednarz and uh, my first SIGGRAPH was in 2009. So it was in Japan, in Yokohama, SIGGRAPH Asia. And I'm coming since then, so it's like addiction. Okay, it's coming. So it's coming to see uh, to see not only the advances in technology, but as well uh, meet friends, mm -hmm. always. So that's uh, you become really like SIGGRAPH family. So we all becoming SIGGRAPH family, and it's very hard to walk 100 meters outside because we're being stopped all the time. So especially when we have like meetings on time, it's very <laughs> very hard to walk fast. So my SIGGRAPH, the, the very first time I've heard about SIGGRAPH was very, very long time ago when I was still in high school. So I'm from Europe and I live now in Australia. And, and in Europe we have something called Demoscene. Uh, if you don't know, it's like underground art stream, which is doing, uh, using like those days, 8-bit computers for doing computer graphics, uh, using assembly language and using crazy mathematics to display, you know, polygons and pixels and animate that all together. Uh, so during those days when I was in high school, we had no access to internet. There was no information it's like today you can find everything on the internet. And I visited one of my friends. Uh, there was like the SIGGRAPH DVD or CD perhaps on, on the shelf. And, and we're looking for how to rotate the bunny or whatever, you know, like trying to find the equations we couldn't find anywhere in the books. We couldn't find, you know, like the solutions that could work in the real time. So I knew about, for instance, funk shading. Uh, when we implemented that, the pixels were just one pixel per perhaps per minute, so very, very slow. I wanted to do it in real time, so trying to find the solutions. And then I was saying I will never come to SIGGRAPH, and now I'm in SIGGRAPH, right? <laughs> so, so always follow your passion, so that's my advice uh, at the end of the story. So uh, to cut the uh, story short, uh, I work currently in Australia, so I'm part of CSIRO Data 61, which is like the digital powerhouse. Uh, doing everything with the data, AI simulations, visualization, immersive technologies, and so on. But that's why I work at uh, UNSW, uh, where I lead the so I'm director of the visualization center. And, and I'm very proud as well to say we're bringing SIGGRAPH Asia to Australia. So SIGGRAPH Asia will be next year in Brisbane in Australia. So if you don't know, uh, now you know. So everybody take out the mobiles and put the calendars in, please, okay? And start working on your submissions. So, and if you have any questions, just feel free to stop me randomly and we can talk about this. I have a couple of like a book, bookmarks and maybe we can do some competitions to give you away. And if you want, and if you don't win, don't, don't get upset. We have some downstairs so you can go and visit our booth and get anyway, so. All right. Okay, a uh, key question here for those of you who are attending here. How many of you consider yourselves to be techies, so writing code or building? Okay, about half, 
which is about right. How many of you would be consider yourself to be more creative, people using the code? Okay, so a nice showing there, and that's very typical about SIGGRAPH. One of the key things that we find at SIGGRAPH and what makes it so much fun is that there are many different communities in SIGGRAPH and very many different interests. So depending on what it is you're most interested in, you should look and focus on the aspects of what you're most interested in. So for the techies, why don't we start out with the uh, thing that you should absolutely go to if you are into the technology itself and want to see the latest and greatest in terms of papers. We have a session right after this one. So at 6 o'clock, we have the papers fast forward. And for anybody who is interested in the technology, what you will see is you will see every technical presentation that is going to be happening over the week will have 30 seconds to convince you that theirs is the paper you absolutely want to go see. It's a lot of fun. It's People get very creative. And to give you an idea, Mashuda and I actually have a paper presented this year. And we think ours is the one you absolutely want to go and see, of course. So come in, go and see what it is. You'll get literally a speed uh, presentation. So think of it as speed dating for geeks. It's you know, This is where you get to see a very, very fast-paced presentation of everything that will be presented in the technology arena over the course of this week. It's very intense. Um, we've seen everything from, what, haikus to rap to just about any sort of presentation. You know, like, oh, yes, exactly. Everything you can possibly imagine will be there as a way of convincing you that that paper is the one you absolutely want to go and see. So. If you're into the technology, that is something you absolutely have to go and see. This is something really interesting. Also, if you're on the creative side, go to the production sessions every day where you will be able to go and see some of the most interesting productions. So the latest special effects in all the movies you've recently seen, you will be able to go and see how they were done. Understand what the challenges were. What did the production team that's presenting actually go through and how they found creative solutions to some of the hardest problems you'll ever encounter. And these are the best of the best. These are the people who blow your mind away every year. This is what you get to see at SIGGRAPH. So again, go out, explore all these. One of the key things that you should be doing too is going to the reception. If you have a full conference access, you have the reception tomorrow night, go there. Bring a lot of business cards. Meet people. Introduce yourself. The relationships that you build up at this conference last a lifetime. Some of my best friends are people that I met at this conference several decades ago, the first time, and have continued going on. Some of them are people who I first met as student volunteers and have now grown in their careers and have gone on to other places as professionals in this. And it's always interesting to see the types of relationships that you build up at this conference. People are very welcoming, so enjoy it. Introduce yourself. Talk to the person sitting next to you, okay, as we break. Find out who they are. Find out where they come from, and you'll find that they come from all over the world. And that they come from very different backgrounds and get to see. And it is something really interesting that I've enjoyed in this conference and why I keep coming back is because of the networking and the relationships that you build up here. You know, what Tomas was describing earlier, you can't walk like more than 10 meters without bumping into somebody that you've met before and that you know and that you will probably interact with in your professional career as you go forwards in this industry. So it's something that's really, really interesting. This is sort of everybody who's doing anything in CG will end up at SIGGRAPH. They will be here. Sometimes they can't be here every year because of production schedules or other interests that we do have to go and do. But you always try. It's once you've tasted it, as Tomas mentioned, it, you will be back. Okay. So we'd like to share some of that experience and doing Tomas or Mashuda. So. Going back a long time, I remember quite vividly my very first SIGGRAPH. I 
had convinced my boss at Manchester University to let all of us in our group come to SIGGRAPH because it was a 10-year anniversary of our research group. And uh, he said, well, you can go as long as you get something into the conference. So a few of us all worked really hard and got some talks into the conference and things, and we were like, yes, we're going to go, we're going to go. And we got here, and then we're looking around, and we're going, oh, my God, I want to see this, I want to see that, I want to see that. Mm -hmm. And it was just so overwhelming that we didn't have a clue how to narrow down what we wanted to see. But very soon, what I realised is, a, is absolutely amazing about this conference is that nobody takes offence if you walk out part way through a session. So if there's one talk in a session of four that you want to go to, then you can go to that talk. You don't have to sit through the whole session. You can then go to something else. If there's a course that you're really, really interested in, you can go to that course and you can spend part of the time in the course until you decide there's something else that you really also want to see that's on at the same time. So don't set yourselves up to try and see everything. You can't. <laughs> there is no way you will see everything. So the papers fast forward tonight is a really, really good way of narrowing down what you would like to see that's technical, if you're interested in technical papers. The courses in the advanced program, the descriptions, it's really good just to take a pen and just like, you know, tick everything that you'd really like to see and then look at the schedule and then narrow it down based on what you can see because you will find that it's too much and you will always be conflicted over what you want to see. Don't be afraid to leave mid-session. If there's something better on or something more exciting that excites you, go to it because every single room will be busy and every single speaker will have an audience. <laughs> so, so make the most of your time here and make the most of um, trying to um, also meet people because like Alain said, the biggest thing that has helped me in SIGGRAPH in the community has been the, the, the people I've met the networks I've built and the friendships I've built here at the conference. And they keep bringing me back every year. Um, everybody is really friendly, right the way up to the conference chair and the committee members and the executive committee, even people like me who's standing for election this year. If you want to go and talk to any of these people, just go, introduce yourself, talk to them. They're all, they're all there to help you, they're all there to advise you, and they're all there to give you um, any, any wisdom they can about how to enjoy the conference. Maybe we should get to Tony. Yeah. What, what are you giving me? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no. Oh, okay. Hi. Hi, everyone. I, I apologize for being late. I was just finishing a session. Uh, I am the Diversity and Inclusion Chair for uh, CGRAF, the organization and the conference, and uh, we just finished up a session. So, uh, so I was running from the east over to the west uh, to basically uh, uh, be a part of this, so I apologize for being late. My name is Tony Bayless. I am uh, basically a <coughs> person that's been involved with CGRAF uh, for <coughs> X years. We'll just leave it at that. Uh, and uh, I work at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. Uh, which is a, a Department of Energy uh, National Lab. Uh, started out in the area of uh, computer graphics and post-production in that area, uh, working for the National Center for Supercomputing Applications before that at the University of Illinois. So uh, basically been around for a long time in this community and uh, I'm back. I had, took a, a hiatus for a little while because I switched uh, to being an administrator uh, at uh, DOE uh, for a while and uh, was out of the technical uh, track for a while and then I moved into this area of diversity and inclusion because I was asked uh, to do this uh, for the department uh, as well as uh, my laboratory and then CGRAF came and said, hey, would you come over and come back to the community and help us with this? So uh, we're on a, a effort to build inclusion uh, globally uh, and have folks like you. Uh, this room is wonderful. I, I, I wish we could take a picture. 
Uh, yeah, we should, we should, yeah, we should, we take, should a, take a we should picture, take. right? So this poem is absolutely beautiful, <laughs> yes. and uh, we 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 really could use your help, your advice, your feedback on how we can be more of an inclusive organization uh, and really reach out to a global audience because we the organization is global, and that's why you're kind of in here and it's part of the beginners, right? So I got to tell you, it, it's a lot of fun. Um, it's a great community to belong in. Um, a lot of people end up being friends for life. Um, a lot of my Facebook friends are my Facebook are, are my folks that basically I met through uh, this community as well as my high performance computing uh, community as well. And uh, we just uh, really anchor each other and all of us know each other for a long time and basically been there. So um, thank you for coming to Seagraph and we hope you find it of a value and if not, talk to us. Let's figure out why, and let's let's try to help you. Um, so we all have help navigate students and uh, newcomers into this area and this is community over the years. So we're more than happy to help you do that. Uh, so mentoring is a big thing for us. Uh, so perhaps continuing on that, on that uh, I should say you know like we are all volunteers, and and you are the future of SIGGRAPH as well. So you know like. Uh, I should have mentioned that, but I think the negative point of SIGGRAPH is that we have lots of parallel sessions, right? So if you're going to be running SIGGRAPH in 20 years, please make it for a whole month, okay? And do like one long session. So just remember about that because it will be super fantastic so we can come for holidays for four weeks in good places uh, some, some, somewhere, somewhere and perhaps like, a, you know, like we haven't we haven't got like a uh, cigraph in Hawaii, for instance. It could be it could be a nice place. And Hawaii. Who's down for Hawaii? Yeah. <laughs> Raise your hand. Okay. I think Australia is on there, but Australia. you know. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So so Australia is next. Save your yeah. money. Yes. Uh, yeah. So uh, one of the things that if I if I can give you one advice about different sessions as well. Uh, so there's like technical program, but you have as well. If you are tech savvy, you can go to look at some you know like equations. If you if you will. Uh, look at very complex mathematics, AI, and simulations, and so on. It's super cool because it's all linked with computer graphics and our pa passion as well. Uh, but if you're tired with that, you can go to art gallery. So downstairs we have art gallery, which is uh, completely switching you off, and you can basically like relax, uh, be in Zen mode. You know, like look what artists are doing. Uh, try to enjoy that as much as you can. We have as well emerging technology section, which is which is looking and, 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 and you know like geeky way connecting different electronics parts and doing like a crazy, you know like a haptic devices with connected to VR and you know uh, I won't be telling you what you're gonna see because you're gonna see that one perhaps after this session or maybe tomorrow. Just enjoy yourself. Just try to make sure to go to every single one of them and ask question because that's how we learn, right? So go and ask questions and. Uh, one perhaps advice that I always, what I always do, I try to actually look what SIGGRAPH, SIGGRAPH provides, you know, access to the papers, right? So everybody who registered to SIGGRAPH can access all the papers online. And one advice I always have, look which papers are of interest to you so you can do what Mashuda said at fast forward session. Uh, but, but as well, look at those sessions that you cannot find anywhere else because some of the talks are not in the papers or not published because are highly copyrighted, okay? So like production sessions, something that you cannot find anywhere else. So that's where you should go definitely as well besides technical papers, art, e-tech, and all other programs that we have in SIGGRAPH. So have very careful you look tonight before you go to sleep and plan your day in advance because it's, it's really important, okay? Yeah. One other thing that I'd like to go and point out for you all, so this is your first SIGGRAPH. I'd like to share a story about my first SIGGRAPH. When I first came, so 1987 was my first conference, and it was actually pretty amazing because I knew SIGGRAPH by reputation. At the time, I had started up a small production studio where we had just landed a contract, which was kind of interesting. So. Our first contract, just to give you a little bit of setting, uh, way back when we had been contracted by French TV to do the special effects for a science fiction series that they were uh, producing. And the people who were producing this didn't quite have an understanding of what was really hard in computer graphics at the time and what wasn't. 
So they contacted us and told us, well, you know, you guys are all doing all this really difficult stuff with polygons and really geometric shapes. We want something much simpler and easier. And they're like, okay, what is the much simpler and easier than you want? Well, we want you to sculpt fluids and gases and make them <laughs> things. Seriously. And we looked at them and said, um, it's not as easy as you think. And we looked at this and what was really interesting, so I was based in Paris, France at the time, and what had happened was we had developed a reputation in Paris of doing all the impossible special effects for the movies and for the TV shows. And so we ended up getting that contract telling the producers very clearly, we don't know how to do this yet, and we're, but we're willing to do the research to figure it out. And what was really interesting is I'd read a paper by Bill Reeves talking about the particle systems that he had developed to do the special effects for the Wrath of Khan and going, this is the technology that we could probably use to go and give them these special effects that they wanted. So we actually took two weeks where we refused any production work and just focused on research. And with my team, we pretty much didn't sleep. I was much younger then. I could get away with that. I can't do that anymore. But at the time, this is, you know, it was motivating to say, yeah, let's go figure out if we can actually use Bill's techniques to be able to go and do this and see. And where did I find the papers? It was the SIGGRAPH proceedings. I looked at the previous year's proceedings in terms of how they had done it, what they had used, and saw that it didn't quite meet my needs because you couldn't actually sculpt it. So our key challenge was, can we actually give these particles a shape that you can recognize? Because what the scenario called for was having this sort of Dr. Frankenstein person come together with his lab to be able to put chemicals in a liquid form that would coalesce to become an artificial human being. And we go like, we have no clue how we're going to go do this. But we tried several things. Um, our first attempts didn't quite work the way we wanted to, so we learned a lot and iterated very, very quickly, but finally came up with something where we could sculpt the overall envelope of the particles and keep them in there so that we could actually get this vaporous and liquid form that would become a human being. And we succeeded in the effects and what was really funny was I talked with my partner in this. It was a pretty small company, but we were, what, seven people in the company? Half artists, half geeks coming up with the stuff. And said, you know, we might want to submit this to SIGGRAPH. And it was really interesting because she was the one who was saying we should submit it. I was going, there's no way we will get to the quality of a SIGGRAPH submission. We will never be selected. And she convinced me otherwise. So we did, and I was sure we will never get selected. And we submitted both the technical aspects and the artistic work in terms of what we've done, and we got accepted for both. So it was actually pretty interesting to get there come over, we had, none of us had ever attended SIGGRAPH. We would read the papers every year, we'd look at what was presented, we'd look at the videos that were produced by SIGGRAPH to see this, and we were all excited about it. And we're going, yeah, on the off chance, maybe we'll get lucky and get selected. We had the biggest party you could ever imagine <laughs> in terms of once we got the acceptance notices, both for the artwork and for the actual technical aspects, it was major party time at my company, and it was a lot of fun. And we got here, and what was hysterical, there was a paper that was presented this that year was by a uh, researcher called Craig Reynolds, who has since become a very close friend. But I just knew him from the work he had done at Symbolics, and I wanted to go see his talk about how he had done flocking algorithms, because the technique that he used was actually fairly similar to what I'd implemented to do the special effect that we were working on. So I went to his talk, and I'm going, okay, this is my first SIGGRAPH. He's a big shot. Everybody knows him in the field. Yeah, maybe I can get him to answer one of my questions at the end of the talk. 
And I'm sitting in the talk, and he goes, and by the way, if you look at the electronic theater tonight, go look at the special effects done by a small Parisian company. He's talking about my work. And I was like, oh, my God. Like, he noticed. And it was pretty amazing to go and see this. It's such a thrill when you see just how open everybody is here in this community and what it means. So after he gave his talk, I went up and introduced myself. And as I, Dr. Reynolds, I'd uh, like to introduce myself. I, the guy who actually did the work that you were mentioning and would love to talk to you about what you did. He goes, oh, do you know Bill Reeves? And I go, uh, yeah, I know who he is. I read his papers, and that's where we derived our stuff from. He goes, well, that's Bill over there. Why don't I introduce you? <laughs> and I was like, OK. And that was why I keep coming back every year, because that was just the beginning, the first time I had something submitted and accepted in this conference, and I've kept doing it over the years. This is what it's all about. This is what happens, and you'll find that the key people whose names, you know, if you are a researcher, if you're looking at the technology, you look at those names, you go, never will they ever talk to me. And you go, well, that's not quite the way it works. It's exactly the opposite. They are wide open. They're curious. This is why we do this. This is why we hold this conference. It's because you'll get to meet the young, up-and-coming new people in the field who are doing something amazing, and you want to talk to them. So don't hesitate. Talk to everybody. Go and share your story. Tell them what you're doing, what you're excited about, and you'll see. They will talk to you. And that's really what makes SIGGRAPH work. It's this community of people who are all curious and want to see, how do we push the envelope? How do we do what we used to think was completely impossible and make it happen? And how does it happen? Well, it comes by talking to people and by meeting them and by sharing your challenges. Like, what is it that gets you up in the morning? What problems are the ones that you see as being impossible? Chances are you'll probably meet somebody who knows how to do what you're trying to do or has an idea or can inspire you to find a way to solve what seems like an impossible problem. So, yep, absolutely. Yep. So that's my short story. <laughs> and that's why I keep coming back is because that level of excitement has built up very strong friendships, very strong collaborations with people all through the industry. Why? Because we talk here. And the idea is I would encourage you all, talk to the people you meet. Share what you're interested in. Ask questions. And when you go to these sessions, ask questions at the end. If there's something there you don't quite know how they actually did it, ask. And you'll find that people are willing to share. They will share their stories, and that's what makes this so exciting. On that note, I was going to ask you if you have any questions for any of our panelists. Can we do one, one exercise based on what he just said? You're in trouble now. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, good, good stuff. I, I, you know, I would like each of you go to your left and introduce yourself to that individual. Just, just go to the left and just uh, it, go and introduce yourself to that individual. Yeah, yeah, and tell them where you're from. Okay. Oh, oh there's a person right there. I, go to your right. They're not there. Okay, I, I want to thank you for doing that very much. That's what we're talking about. It's really engaging and basically getting to know your community and the people in it. Um, these individuals that you just, now what's going to possibly happen is as you walk down the hallways, you know, as we do in Chicago, a little head nod, 
you know? <laughs> or are you going to say, hey, hi, good to see you again? You know, and then maybe some more conversation that happens along the lines of what we've built as colleagues over the years is just, you know, having that interaction. And I'm sorry if I put some people out of their comfort zone, but that's part of this. That's part of this uh, getting your network, growing your network, and actually being a part of something uh, of value because that is going to be of value to you because I often mentor and, and talk to students about the fact of, you know, you, in order to elevate yourself, you know, you have to sometimes get out of that comfort zone. You have to get those risks, and you actually have to introduce yourself to people like Alain did to someone he thought was really, really at a high level, and that person was like, hey, let me bring my other friend over, you know, and we're going to talk about the work that you did, which was awesome. So with that said, you know, you never know who you might meet. They can get you your job. They can actually help you with your research. They can help you just get through school. So with that said, you, you want to try and, you know, reach out to people, especially in this community, because it's a really grand community. It really is. Uh, it's one of the reasons why I said yes to coming back, um, because I, I love the people so much. Um, and uh, we have a really good network. So with that, yes. We have uh, 25 minutes or so yeah. to answer questions. Do you all have any questions uh, that pertain to the conference or the organization? I'm empty. And, and what else? I'm, I'm empty. Anything. 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 Yeah. Yes. Questions yes, anything. about anything. <laughs> anything. Yes, oh, sorry. Yes, anything. Don't be shy. Yeah, don't be shy. Anyone? So, so they are like a bit, uh, I would say, less, less uh, unstructured. So they are organized like if you have passion about something, you can propose beds of the further sessions, and and it's basically like a, a lightweight. So you don't need to have like you know super big committees, you know, reviewing your submissions and so on. So you can actually follow your passion. So for instance, today, so that's what I do. Like for instance, I run like demos in beds of the feather. Uh, because this is my passion, that's my that's my history. So I was part of demos a long time ago, and I keep coming back with that. And today we have demos in uh, beds of the feather sessions when I invited four uh, excellent speakers from demos in talking about their experience. So those are completely random people who are coming to. I mean, they, those are not random people, but people who are coming to SIGGRAPH Asia uh, and SIGGRAPH here. We could ask them to to be part of the of the conversation. And we had like a bit of problem because the session was run in this room and we have as well overflow of the people. So mm -hmm. that's the problem. So when you do beds of the feathers, which is super popular, and then you need to measure, you know, what rooms you need as well. So when you submit in beds of the feathers, it's very simple submissions. It's like, you know, 100, 120 or 140 words or whatever. It's like a really short abstract. And, and it's getting on the website and you basically need to organize a session the way you want. So like this one is gonna be like kind of bits of the feather session anyway. It's kind of like this kind of, you know, unstructured and you run it the way you want, which is great. So. Yeah, well, th th you know, one thing to understand about uh, SIGGRAPH, you know, what the yeah. conference is, it is a 13 ring circus, okay? There is so much going on at any one time. The reason we introduced Birds of a Feather sessions was to allow us to go and have a really lightweight structure to be able to try new ideas out. So typically what you'll find on Birds of a Feather is something where a key volunteer in the organization has decided, you know, this could be fun, let's try it out. Let's not put in too big of a structure at first. Let's get a sense for how popular it is, how people react to it, and then see if we want to take it to the next level and push it into something a bit more structured with a formal jury, that type of thing. But the idea is what we want to be doing in this field, and specifically in computer graphics, it's things evolve so quickly. Okay, it's something that is actually amazing. It's one of the fastest uh, levels of acceleration of technology in any field compared to computing for, you know, basic computing for instance. To give you an idea, I used to be uh, at ATI where we worked on develop, you know, my job was develop drivers for all the new chips that were coming out. So are you all familiar with Moore's Law? 
you all familiar. Okay, so the idea for those of you who may be less familiar with it is to say that basically the power of a computer doubles every 18 months. Do you know what the equivalent for Moore's Law is in computer graphics? Because it's not the same. We actually double in power every six months. Think of that. And think of what that implies in terms of the technology that we're managing in this field. Today, we're still going at a rate where we're doubling in capacity. If you look at the games today, okay, so look at a video game and look at the quality of the rendering you have now and think back, what was it like two years ago? And you're like, oh my God, it's five times, eight times faster now than it was then? And we have never in the history of technology seen that level of acceleration anywhere else, okay? And we're not done yet. We still haven't hit the limits of physics in terms of what we can do, despite roughly every five years or so, somebody screams, oh my God, we've come to the end. You know, we're going to fall off the edge of the earth. And well, yeah, nothing gets an engineer excited as being told that something's impossible. And we always find ways to get around it. So that's what, why this field is so exciting, because we are accelerating faster than anybody has ever seen. And we don't see the end of this yet. And my sense is, as long as we have people like you coming to this conference every year and coming up with new creative ideas as to how we could do better, we'll continue to do that. And that's why it's so much fun, because the end isn't in sight yet. We still have so much more that we can do. And every time we start seeing like, yeah, oh, we've done ray tracing, we don't have to do anything more. Well, okay, let's go do global illumination. Okay, we've done that, what do we do next? Mm -hmm. And we'll come up, there is always something that we can do better and something that we can get more excited about. And they'll get people to try out new things that they have never tried before because we thought it was impossible. What we're finding is that every year, what we used to think was impossible, well, we actually see it at SIGGRAPH. So another way to actually look at it is uh, building community and networking. Uh, they were talking about the academic, technical track. There's also just community in general. So there will be BOFs that centered in on educators. There will be students in a certain discipline or a certain area. There will be BOFs with LGBTQA community that want to get together and network. So it's a way to build community as well uh, in a smaller setting because this is a large conference with a lot of people. So sometimes people use BOFs to actually build that sort of smaller network or community to actually help with what they're trying to do. So, uh, you know, like I'm, I'm partnering with a, a colleague of mine that basically was on a panel earlier and we have an others BOF on Thursday. So that, that others is everybody. So we want everybody to be a part of it and, and basically try to formulate a community because he felt that there was missing a community that he uh, wanted to have be a be part of Seagraph again. It used to be and then it went away for a while. So he wants to actually try to initiate it again. So definitely think of BOFs as the smallest subset of the conference in a community setting that you can have a little group meeting around and have a conversation about something that you're really passionate about or care about. In general. You want more questions? Okay. I have a question for all of you. Like, why did you choose the computer graphics to do for the presentation? I actually did a chemistry degree, believe it or not, not a computing degree. <laughs> In the final year of my degree, I learned, this is going to date me now, standard Fortran 77 to do some um, programming for um, simulation of um, chemical reactions. Simultaneously, I got taken um, by a friend of mine, a very good friend of mine, to see some silicon graphics computers. And I was completely blown away by a fly through over a textured terrain. And I was like, oh my God, I cannot draw. I need to learn how to do that. Yeah. <laughs> so I went and convinced 
um, the admissions director for MSc conversion course in computer science at Manchester University to let me in with a chemistry background. And he said, sure, come on. And um, the rest is history. I stayed doing computer graphics ever since. Yeah. So, so for me, so for me, so how many of you know uh, compu computers like Commodore C64? Yeah, so some of you. So in Europe, we have like a zine that was called uh, C C64, C C64, and what they were doing, they were printing he hexadecimal numbers. So it's like pages of numbers, right? And what you have to do, you had to enter those numbers, and then you have some music playing or some graphics being displayed and so on. That, that's how we were programming computers those days, right? So there was no editors, no high-level languages. Everything was machine code, okay? So that actually, like, uh, put my eyes a bit more into, like, well, how I do those numbers a bit more elegantly. So I decided that I want to understand how the computers work. And when I got, you know, like the very first PC very, very long time ago in the 80s, uh, then I said, like, the way to learn how to program computer will be perhaps to go into assembly. It's like DOS uh, was like a disk operating system then. And, and I was saying, like, maybe I should start with assembly, so like learning how everything works interoperates. And the way to do it, I decided to write computer viruses. It's a secret, okay? Don't tell anyone. <laughs> I don't think this is streamed now, right? <laughs> Streaming is. <laughs> so, uh, so, uh, so I was doing uh, computer viruses for half a year, learning assembly and learning how the interruption work, how you do uh, basic operations on the beats, how how you actually make one program to multiply millions times, and so on. So, uh, I did experiments even with like a, uh, went went to the uh, markets, computer markets, and gave one copy of my virus to a person, and it was spread across the globe. Uh, though I must admit, I wasn't doing like harmful viruses. It was just on the, you know, like experiments. They were taking lots of memory, so you couldn't run anything, anything else if it was infected. But it wasn't destroying anything like others people were doing. But after, after a couple of months, I became very, very guilty about that. <laughs> and I said, I need to change, and I need to find something else. And I was saying, like, you know, if you can draw one pixel on the screen, you can do anything. That's how my computer graphics started, really. So starting actually digging into uh, still assembly and Pascal. And believe or not, uh, the higher level languages are very, very slow. So, like, we use Pascal. And my Pascal was, like, begin, ASM, assembly, boom, 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 <laughs> and, 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 that's it. Because the... It was like so slow. So if you're doing real time computer graphics those days, you need to do lots of tricks. And I can talk about it forever. So if you have any questions about that, we can talk afterwards. Okay. Okay, I'm a little bit older than Mashuda and Tomas. So <laughs> we'll go back into prehistory. You just forget me over here. I guess <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm old. Oh, yeah. That's why I only mentioned <laughs> Mashuda okay. and Tomas. Right. Well, I, I know how old you are, Tony. <laughs> <laughs> But so what I started out uh, doing, I actually was a math major, and I was looking at describing the performance of computing systems in a probabilistic uh, way. So what I was doing was running massive simulation runs every night on what was considered to be a supercomputer at the time. So just to go and date me, the computer at the time was a one megahertz computer, one. And it had a full megabyte of memory, one, okay? <laughs> but that was a supercomputer. Uh, to give you an idea, most uh, labs actually share th that type of architecture amongst 20 to 30 researchers, just to give you an idea. So that is where all this gray hair comes from. It comes from waiting for my pro programs to compile and execute. And the person who had uh, the uh, office next to mine in my lab was Henri Gouault. So Ali Gouraud was the guy who invented Guro shading, okay? And Ali goes to me and goes, hey, you've got this supercomputer all to yourself. I've got a whole mess of graphics students who would love to use it at night when it's not overloaded. Would you mind bringing them on to go and do this uh, ray tracing stuff? I had no idea how compute intense ray tracing was. And I said yes because I had just had, you know, I, my PhD was freshly minted. I had literally been in this lab for about a year at the time, and had just graduated and had this, and I was going, yeah, I remember how hard it was to be able to get onto 
any decent computing system, I mean, we would steal uh, passwords from the physics department because they had a bigger computer system than the math department had. And oh yeah, it was you know anything was good to be able to compute. And so I felt sorry for the kids and said, sure, by all means, bring the artists on. I go, artists, what can they do with my computer? I very quickly learned. Whereas I'd be able to run something like 10 simulation runs a night. As soon as the artists were on, I couldn't get a single uh, simulation run to terminate. So that was actually putting my research into, you know, in serious jeopardy. And I went to Ali and said, look, look, Ali, I'm going to have to go and kick your students off because I can't do my research. And he looked at me and, yeah, said, look, would you really do that to these poor art students who don't have any access anywhere? And you go like, yeah, yeah, make me feel like really like a monster here if I kick them off. And he goes, look, you're a specialist in computer performance. I'm sure that their code isn't particularly well optimized. Why don't you have a look at their source code and see if you can improve it? And I started doing that. And what was really interesting was what I was doing in terms of my research was generating a whole mess of numbers and I would be looking at spreadsheets all day long. And all of a sudden I had these beautiful pictures coming out the other end. And ended up going to see my research director and saying, um, you know, I'd like to change research topics. <laughs> this was just way more fun. And I did actually get, you know, two orders of magnitude improvement in the performance of the software because I knew how and I knew how to go and find all of the key aspects and from then on it's been computer graphics ever since. So that's how I got in. It was literally having the satisfaction of being able to go and see your results and you know, just looking at any of the pictures you could tell when you got the algorithms wrong. It was pretty obvious. So that was a major change for me was to be able to go and visually inspect what the results were like and see that and start working on it to try and figure out, okay, how can I use the math I know to be able to make better pictures? And that's what I've been doing for close to 40 years now. And uh, so I'll try to be short. The science, the technology, and you, the people. So the individuals that I got to work with over the years, uh, ended up being wonderful developers like Milan and founded companies, things of that nature, we were working at ILM and Lucas and doing all these cool movies, Pixar, founding Pixar and everything else. So the individuals um, that I got to basically work with, and I, not a computer science background, I learned it on the job uh, with working with folks. I, was, I got a degree in film and television and worked in the areas, um, but I, uh, the individuals that brought me in and helped me to understand about how they were able to analyze the data and what that insight brought to them as far as visualizing that data. So I worked with a visualization team at NCSA and at the University of Illinois on those larger supercomputers. Um, but uh, just to see the light in their eyes when they actually saw those numbers light up a entire galaxy and that and us to see that galaxy and fly around in it oh man that was just cool i felt i mean i i i i, I thought i was a man on the moon uh and doing some of the work we did i mean i mean i was out there chasing tornadoes and doing visualizing the data from the, the tornadoes that we were basically chasing so i mean that was fun i mean dangerous but fun i mean <laughs> You know, you know those those kind of things, and but to see the light um, in the eyes of researchers like these, and helping them achieve what they wanted to achieve, that's that's what really uh, got me excited about computer graphics. And then when I came to this community, uh, my mind was blown with all the people that I got to see and be around, and uh, still is really is. It's, it really is still blown. Um, every day I get to meet new people. So um, I'm thankful. So I'm blessed to be in computer graphics. Other questions? Huh? Yeah, it was a good question. It was. Great question. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
<laughs> what are you all interested in for, you know, uh, I mean, you're beginners here, first timers, some of you possibly, and it, you know, what are you interested, really trying to see? I mean, is it the film? You know, the electronic theater used to be a big thing. Still is. You know, so seeing all that, that stuff, and we make it fun for you, too. Each and every year, they get creative. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I mean, what brought you here? Quite honestly, I mean, you know, uh, it's, uh, the work should really force you to come to Vancouver. <laughs> yeah, right? Did work really force you to Vancouver? Or if those of you in Vancouver, oh, right? you basically like, oh, yeah, I'll go down to the convention center, hang out downtown for a while, right? <laughs> yeah, I'll go if I have to. Yeah, I'm sure there's something that brought you here, and uh, we'll be more than happy to help you with that, so if you had a question about it. Yeah, so, yeah. Fantastic. So I think I think what we can start with, uh, you can start with Maybe courses, perhaps. Just to make sure everybody else. Yeah. So uh, so we had question about the software engineering and how to connect software engineering with computer graphics, basically, right? And how to start. Uh, so I'm saying perhaps like the fastest way would be to look at the courses program. Because courses are structure, for, you have like three different levels. You have like beginners, intermediate, and advanced. And you can start with something, depends what your interests are, because software engineering can go in many different directions as well. So follow your heart, okay? That's what I would say. Mm -hmm. What you love to do, and just follow your heart, find the courses that will speak to you, and go and enjoy those. And then once you have the basic understanding, maybe you can try to test it as well some technical papers that are a bit more complex. But as Mashuda and Alan before said, don't be afraid to ask people the questions. Go and explore. So that, that's my advice. So. And I'll add to that because we just had that conversation uh, with a, uh, a breaking bias panel that we just had with women. And that the few of the women on that panel had talked about being software engineers. And then also one was a photographer. And she went into post-production and, and became a colorist expert. And as a result of that, that's kind of what you were trying to do. And what she had was she had uh, also not only going to the courses and things of that nature, that that's going to be important as well. Uh, also meeting those individuals like her and others that basically uh, will be able to shed some light on how you can make that transition. So finding a mentor or a person to network with about that transition would also add value. So if you can definitely find uh, an individual along those lines that made that tra transition, then they can offer some additional advice on how you might be able to do, especially if you're looking for a job or already in a job and want to make that transition. And they, you know, the majority of uh, folks would be more than happy to provide that advice. So I'll tell you a funny story about how I found a mentor. My mentor, one of my mentors, is actually Alain Chenet over there. And I was tasked with finding a venue for a cocktail party, secret, super secret cocktail party that was invitation only. So I went up to Alain and begged and pleaded with him if we could use his suite at the time for a cocktail party. And he said yes. And the, the task in the cocktail party was actually to design a computer graphics related cocktail. The idea was that you had to do something that was in some, ha uh, some way kind of computer graphics-y. And at the time, I didn't know that Alan had been the lead um, in the Maya software development team, but I invented the Maya cocktail. <laughs> and that's good. how I found a mentor. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
there are other ways. <laughs> there, there, yes. there are definitely other ways. So, <laughs> I love it. Drinking. You're up here advertising drinking. No, 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 no. So, uh, so uh, basically, there. Uh, Seagrab does have a mentoring type program. You can uh, basically be a part of it. Um, there's other organizations, universities, others that actually have it uh, as well. Uh, I, I would. Uh, advise you to try to figure out, okay, what is it that you want a mentor to basically do? And define that for yourself. Uh, mentoring is a reciprocal relationship. You basically have to find someone who give and take, right? So you, you're gonna have to find some people and sometimes some, some um, folks have uh, got tired of mentoring, just to be frank and blunt and stuff. So you wanna be careful about who you choose uh, as well and ask the question. Um, you know, would you basically, I mean, I, I asked one of the women on the panel, I said, hey, hey, I got an 18 year old who basically want to make the same transition that you just made from photography into computer graphics. Would you mind talking to him? So that was the first step, having a conversation. Mm -hmm. So having, establishing a dialogue and a conversation with someone, especially when they have time, make sure they have time. And then also try to sit down with them over, buy them a cup of coffee. Go to Starbucks here, all right, not doing advertisement for Starbucks, but anyway, uh, buy a cup of coffee or something and ask if they have 15 minutes, but when in that 15 minutes, all right, that's your sales pitch, all right, sales pitches are shorter than that, as you know, all right, but that is your 15 minutes to try and say, hey, can you give me some advice on X, Y, Z, and maybe end it with, would you mind having a conversation with me from time to time? Guess what? That's a mentoring relationship. So, you know, that, that, that's a, a, a really good way of practice. It's the best practice to actually go and build a mentor that way. Um, but there are other mentor uh, ways as well, formal ways and things of that nature. Okay? Uh, I think we're gonna be, we, we're slowly running out of time, unfortunately, but uh, what I should say. Yes, so time flies. Uh, so, uh, just to close off from myself, what I wanted to say, like, uh, like four of us would be very happy if you meet us, you know, somewhere outside, just feel free to stop and ask any questions. We can help you as well, maybe possibly if you tell us a bit about your story, maybe find us with those mentors, maybe, maybe we can help. So we can try to do our best. And, and the last, last thing from myself is, uh, SIGGRAPH is, not only conference, SIGGRAPH is as an organization, and SIGGRAPH is not only the only one in America, so we have also SIGGRAPH Asia, which is very important too. So you can have SIGGRAPH experience twice a year, okay? <laughs> Don't tell anyone, twice a year. So now we are in Vancouver, and in December, all of you will see you in Tokyo, okay? Problems. I'm running over from the other one. Oh, yeah.